Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. are the only you on the planet. And if you block your particular instincts and your uniqueness, the world will not have it. And then it will be lost forever. And that is your responsibility as an artist, I believe, is to keep the channel open. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope. I am joined today by another, by a very special guest who we are always happy to have on the podcast. Um, Katie, do you want to reintroduce yourself? Of course, Jack. Um, I'm Katie Menard. I'm uh, the social specialist here at Backstage. Um, so I basically run all of our social media mm-hmm. on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. TikTok. Uh, all of it. Yeah. Um, and how has that been going? Like the last couple weeks have been crazy. And it's been that it's they have. The, <laughs> there was the holidays and now it's a new year. Like, what do we need to know about like what's going on over at Backstage Social? Yeah. I mean, despite 2020 being a genuinely horrible year. Yeah. It was a pretty great year for Backstage on Social. It was. It was. Um, yeah. You know, we got to launch the slate and provide mm-hmm. resources for actors and creators in quarantine. And, you know, it's still quarantine and it yeah. will be for a while. So <laughs> we're still continuing our sort of video and educational offerings and. Uh, celebrity interviews and everything for that into 2021. Mm -hmm. And we are reformatting it to be a little more in depth and high quality um, moving forward for some long lasting series. So keep an eye out for those Mm -hmm. in 2021. Um, Can I ask, can I give a special shout out to our Instagram reels? Um, Oh yes. Yes, of course. (laughs) Like what should listeners who have no idea are, you know, what our Instagram presence is like, what are our, like what are some of the hit reels that we have? Yeah. Those are so awesome. So if anyone listening doesn't know what an Instagram reel is because right. it's new, right. um, totally. Instagram basically launched last year um, looping vertical videos. I'm sure you've seen it now because they placed it right in the middle of your navigation bar at the bottom. Yes, so I app. accidentally click it all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they're really awesome. They get really great visibility on Instagram Mm. and they're promoting them a lot. And we've started using them to kind of reformat a lot of our content that we've had for years in a really awesome video way. Um, So you can get to know and see all of that content really quickly and digest it really easily. Mm -hmm. And they look really great. Our designer, Erica, um, has spearheaded those designs and I love them. Yes. One of my favorites she did was we did one about uh, voiceover microphones um, for Mm -hmm. folks to use because so many people are getting into voiceover during the pandemic since you can do that work remotely. And she animated and illustrated all of those mics and they looked really, really great. (laughs) Yeah. Well, awesome. And um, sea shanties? No, just kidding. Um. I mean, (laughs) since you you bring up... (laughs) sea shanties and tiktok um we will be uh putting out some some new tiktok content i can't say too much about it right now yeah. but uh keep an eye out on backstage backstage's tiktok yeah we'll, we'll start to shout that some, out because we're new there yeah we'll be doing some some new tiktok specific content um moving yeah. forward okay well katie thank you this is so great but also um listeners today's guest is sarah paulson what can we say about today's guest Sarah Paulson. What can I say about Where Sarah Paulson? Where do we Paulson? even begin? <laughs> yeah. One of the greatest actors 
<laughs> of our time. It cannot honestly. be overstated. Absolutely. It, it really can't. And I think especially we've seen throughout the past few years, um, the rise in quality of television acting, especially. Yes. And I feel like Sarah Paulson is one of the prime examples of that. She's like a prime like American of Horror that. Story alone. Yeah. The idea that she's reinventing herself each season and playing a completely different character and giving the greatest performance each time. Like that Isn't that an actor's dream? It's the dream. Like that and to be that like changed the game. On a show, but you get to <laughs> To exactly to totally reinvent. bring this new character and totally new story every yeah. single time and swing for the fences i mean yeah, she's so yeah, yeah. good at that i also just consider her to be the kind of the prime example of like not just an actor who's really good at what they do but who also happens to be really good at talking about what they do mm. she's yeah. been like i think i think of her as someone who like we on the backstage staff just speak about her like Almost like she's our friend or like our pal or like someone who, <laughs> someone she who is on our side. Yeah, like she knows how to speak to backstage users. She's a former backstage user herself, first of all. Yeah, she's very much like an actor's actor. Yes. If that makes sense. Yes. And I feel like she is someone based on so much that I've read and heard from co-stars of hers mm. that's wonderful to work with. Yeah, yeah, totally. As a fellow actor and like a scene partner and... It seems like she bonds so much with people on set. Totally. Um, and with monkeys on set. Um, I don't know if you saw that video of her with the <laughs> monkey on Ratchet. <laughs> no. Um, no, I thought She that was... loved that monkey. That's it's, so funny. I highly recommend it. <laughs> There's a video of her bonding with it on set. Um, she has chemistry with everyone. Every single actor in a scene yeah. <laughs> gets <Exactly>. tension. <laughs> right. That's the thing that she's she really is having a very good year with um, mm. both Ratchet and Run. It's a great it's a great year for Sarah Paulson. Really, this interview is just scratching the surface, but um, yeah, I can't wait for everyone to hear it. Is there? I can't wait to listen to it. Yeah, I should have sent you the audio before this. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. No, yeah, we're pumping these episodes out. This is also listeners, as as you can tell, this is a Tuesday episode. We are doing twice a week episodes for the time being. This is quite a busy award season. There are so many contenders. And so I'm so glad we were able to include one of the queens of TV, Sarah Paulson. Thank you, Katie, for joining me. Thank you for having me, Jack, especially on this episode. Yeah, I, I thought I'm of you. I'm a big Sarah Paulson fan, thing. so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited. Okay, um, well, let's take a quick break and then get to it. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you for having me, Jack. This podcast is, of course, brought to you, listeners, by Backstage. Listen, aside from all the great inspiration and tips and all of that stuff we offer for free, like this amazing podcast, Backstage also gives you access to incredible casting calls all over the world. That is why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you're curious or if you're an actor yourself and you really want to jumpstart your career and you're ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here in this very episode and use it, go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E. That's, again, 30 days completely free to try backstage where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start browsing the casting notices, and start applying to jobs because who knows, maybe one day I'll be interviewing you. Again, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. Emmy, Golden Globe, and SAG Award winner Sarah Paulson has been acting professionally since high school, training on New York City stages and launching her prolific TV career with an episode of Law & Order, including about 10 different roles on Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk's American Horror Story anthology. Sarah has created compelling characters in Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, Game Change, 12 Years a Slave, Carol, American Crime Story, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, Glass, and more. She now leads the Netflix drama Ratchet as Nurse Mildred Ratchet and Hulu's thriller film Run. Here is the masterful Sarah Paulson. Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you? I'm so good. How are you? I'm so excited to talk to you. 
Oh, I'm so glad. I'm excited to talk to you too. I like your shirt very much. No one can see it, but I can see it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. You look cute. Are you in Los Angeles? I am in California. Yes. You're in California and that's been home for a while. I think of you, I still think of you as a New Yorker. Yeah. I think I still think of me as a New Yorker too, but I have to sort yeah. of like let go of the ghost and realize that that's just not the truth anymore. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. Um, I do not expect you to remember this at all, but we spoke on the phone a couple years ago for Sterling K. Brown's backstage cover story, where I just wanted like two sentences of praise for Sterling from you. Um, but then because I had you on the phone for 10 minutes, I then like randomly asked you, how do you memorize your lines? And then the backstage article, how Sarah Paulson memorizes her lines, like continues to be one of our top performing articles. So wow. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad to be of service. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And you are. That's and great. Listen, that also can give you an idea of like, uh, as you know, we're backstage and we're all, we're all about the nitty gritty. I'm going to ask you all about the nitty gritty. That's all the stuff I love to talk about. It's like half the time nobody's interested in that stuff, but it's the stuff I always I was interested in reading about when I would read about actors uh, and their process. And so for me, I always feel like the fact that anyone wants to know what mine is, is just like, I still remember being a kid on the subway reading backstage and it's just, it's kind of a, a pinch me thing. I have to say it's cool. Thank you. That's so great. Did you use backstage to um, get work? Um, I didn't, I didn't only because I wasn't pursuing work actively when I was looking at backstage because I was still in high school. It wasn't really till I finished. And then I got, you know, it was oh. one of those very lucky birds who got a job very quickly out of high school and had an agent. Yeah. And so I, I kind of got lucky that way. How did you get the agent? I had a teacher, um, in, in high school who was a substitute teacher um, who did not know that technically speaking at, at LaGuardia High School for the performing arts or performing arts, whatever you want to call it, um, we were not really supposed, we were not encouraged to work outside of the school environment. We were not, you know, we were not professional children's school where the, where the students were often, you know, actively working actors. This was, I think, modeling itself after more of a conservatory and sort of, you know, we were yet to be sure. finished finished uh, products in terms of our uh, education. And so um, they didn't really sanction it, but she didn't really know this. And so I guess she <laughs> recommended me to an agent um, and that's how it happened. And she came to see me in a, that's fascinating. in a scene study class, I feel. And it was it just, I got really lucky. I don't, I went and had an interview with her and then that was that. And that was, that was, did that lead to, um, was Law and Order the first kind of on camera role? Law and Order was the first on-camera role. Yeah. That is such a quintessential actor experience, like New York actor. It, to me, it's like, if you haven't done it, can you even call yourself a New York actor? <laughs> I don't know, you know? Yeah. It's like, meaning um, it is a yeah. rite of passage. Like, I don't, I don't care how, what it looks like. You've got to, you got to <laughs> be walking through the background. You got to be in the scene. You got to be doing some, some, something on Law and Order in whatever iteration. And yeah, yeah. it's, it's a real rite of patch passage, I think. You know, it's also funny. I think we've, it's, we've heard it several times on this podcast where somebody's in a high school or college program where they are not allowed to, uh, to work professionally, but always those people have broken that rule. It's because they broke the rule that they launched their careers. So it's a funny, weird thing, isn't it? And I did break the rule and I knew better. She did not. You did. So okay. I knew that it wasn't really kosher, but I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What was the initial goal? Like, was it screen acting or stage acting or both? Or like, how much do you separate the two? Um, well, it's hard to say what I thought then versus what I think now. I mean, I think then mm. I was so, you know, you have that funny combination of feeling, um, like everything is possible. And of course you're going to work the way you fantasize about. And of course it's going to be just like you want. And why wouldn't it? Because you're an actress and you live in New York and you go to school for it. And you, you know, like all these, you know, you see actors everywhere. And, you know, I went to school right behind Lincoln center and, you know, you, it just, mm. it just, I could walk around the theater district and this is just like what you do for a living, like anything else. And you study hard and you learn about it. Yeah. And of course you'll get to do it. And of course that becomes very quickly uh, yanked out from under you and you realize that that is just not the way it goes at all, which is so sure. painful. So in the beginning, I think I thought I'll just work in whatever way I could get it. And I thought for sure I would yeah. just simply because I didn't understand um, anything about anything, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Um, what you need. Yeah, yeah. And what you need. And, and also I had yet to really understand that merit that this, this industry is often not a meritocracy and, how painful mm -hmm. that can be and confusing mm -hmm. that can be because, 
you know, there are still some people from my high school class who I think are more talented than I could ever dream of being who did not have mm-hmm. uh, a pathway towards um, a working life. And, and yeah. you know, who's to say why in a lot of ways. Um, totally. So, you know, I think for me, I don't, you know, I haven't been on stage now in a, in a almost mm-hmm. 10 years, which nine years. Um, last play I did was with Danny Burstein and Tally Svali at the roundabout and certainly a wonderful way to have ended my theater career. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, Not meaning, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know at this point, I don't know how it, I don't know. It's been so long now that I fear I might have like spooked myself in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, thinking about what that would look like, even, you know, daring to, to trod the boards again. Sure. But you've also said spooking yourself is kind of the name of the game. Yes. <laughs> yes, Jack, that is that is correct. And of course, I want to ask you about it. And I can't wait to talk about um, Run and Ratchet both because you've certainly worked in horror before, but things have taken a turn this year. <laughs> but can I ask first, like, what were, the, what were the earliest original inspirations, which, as I understand it, were never horror? Oh, my God, no. Hor- horror. horror is something that I... Um, the irony is just not lost on me. I am scared yeah. of my own shadow. I don't know how I found myself in the middle of this genre and having <laughs> some success in it. It's just shocking yeah. to me. Um, my parents watched, I had very, very young parents who wanted mm. to watch what they wanted to watch. And that meant a lot of Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street and The Shining and The Exorcist and those things. You know, my sister and I were just like, <laughs> you know, it was just really terrifying. Um, yeah. So we were we were introduced to it quite at a, at a very young age, but but the truth of the matter is the horror genre, the thing that's so spectacular about it is that it is so, um, the stakes are always exceedingly high. So you have a real, yeah. um, you have real permission to go full tilt boogie. And that is Ooh. always going to be really exciting for an actor because a lot of times, you know, we are relegated to, um, depending on your gender, your race, um, mm. whatever uh, you get pigeonholed into sort of continually auditioning for, or, or you know, if you're lucky mm-hmm. enough to actually get the job, you tend to kind of repeat. They ask you to just repeat the thing they know you can do. So mm-hmm. um, that is sort of frustrating when you know you can do more. And I, one thing about the horror genre is that it, it asks you to come come correct, come full, come, mm-hmm. you know, you, everything's at stake in a horror film and not, you yeah. know, it's when you really think about Ellen Burstyn and the exorcist, or you think about, mm-hmm. you know, Joe Beth Williams and poltergeist, you know, you think about the stakes and like, you know, they're very basic things like the protecting your children and, um, but, yeah. the, but the extremes, uh, it allows so for extreme. a lot of extremes. And in that comes, I think, great freedom to, to, to bring it, to bring it all and put it on the floor, yeah. you know? Well, and it's funny, it's interesting you say, you use the word permission to go there because doesn't it sometimes, does it ever feel like um, burden, like a responsibility, a very scary, intimidating like stakes to get to the stakes that are that high? I think uh, this is something I think about all the time because I've just now started to feel like this this world has sort of taken its toll on my psyche and also my physical body, uh, emotionally as well. It's, yeah. um, because I think what happens when you deplete the coffers and you don't replenish it with rest, mm. uh, and some mm. kind of fortification that does not involve you sort of turning your guts inside out. Uh, I, I think some of it has to do with, um, For me personally, I don't have what I believe to be some kind of rock solid technical training that allows me to dip in and out of these sort of psychological Uh membranes and then just be automatically fine. If I have Mm. to run from a clown, as I've often done (laughs) on American Horror Story, or if I have to be, if I'm being pursued or if I'm in a state of real terror, I don't know how to simulate it. Uh, So that's a real Mm -hmm. testament to my lack of skill, what I know how to do is to really feel it. And so when I really feel it, it means my, my mind knows that I'm calling something forward or putting myself in a particular state of mind, but my body doesn't really know the difference between, you know, I think they've talked about, and I've talked about before, you know, I think they've measured what happens to your body on an opening night for an actor. And it's like, it's the same adrenaline, like being in a car crash. It's that intense. And so we put ourselves through all of these things for our work in a way that is 
I think there's something in, in the pursuit of offering comfort to people and uh, insight into human behavior and, and to allow people yeah. to not feel so alone on the planet. There is nobility in what artists do and actors do to sort of yeah. put themselves in the line of personal fire in a way. Um to to create these these environments and these worlds that people can can you know drop inside of and then come back into their own lives and um it costs something you know for me anyway i wish i knew how to i wish i knew how to do it in a way where i could just go great what's for lunch you know but i'm the one in the corner sort of like trying to get my breath and trying to calm myself down so it has gotten to that point now where it's like you know i think i need a nice light-hearted buddy picture because (laughs) because (laughs) i don't have a lot left in the in the till it's like there's um you know it's been depleted and i need a little bit of a you know I need to fill it up yeah. with something else so then I can turn my insides out and, and do that. Hello, my dog just came in. Hi. It's the doggy. Hello. The new doggy. Newish. Newish, yeah, since the beginning of this pandemic. Hi, we need. Do you want to come say hi to Jack? <laughs> She's like, not really. I'm interested in bacon only. <laughs> Basically, bacon only. Oh. <laughs> um, I don't give her bacon. Just don't worry. I'm not encouraging a heart attack in the dog. I don't give her bacon. Oh, bacon. But she would be very interested in bacon if I were re- willing to give it to her. She doesn't know the word bacon. She doesn't know the word bacon, but she knows the word cat, and she knows the word squirrel, and she knows the word um, really? dinner and breakfast. But if I say the word cat out Ugh. loud, she like will run headfirst into the glass door, and it's like, you know, oh, then it would only be my fault because I said the word. Oh, she's like a hunter. Yeah, she's, so like really, a, she's a terrier of sorts, too. So, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, can I ask you about 2020 and, like... Huh? Like Happy New Year, because this is such a <laughs> this is such a turning point. And like, I actually think that it goes directly to what you were just saying. Like, it's not off topic to ask, how do you replenish yourself? How are you staying inspired? Like, are you? Um, what do you mean when you say that your process has changed? Has had to change? Has had to adapt? And you got to think about a little bit more about your resilience. Yeah, well, I think when I was younger, I was so desperate to work, and I so wanted to have the experience of of really living my life as an actor, and I I wanted it so badly, and I was not getting very many opportunities to do anything of of any real interest for me. Um, mm-hmm. It's not that I wasn't able to work; I was lucky enough to work, but it was never oh, sure. anything that was stimulating beyond, Mm -hmm. you know, able to pay my rent, which is no small goddamn thing, let me tell you right now. Um, So I don't mean to disparage that as being enough of a reason to take any job ever. I I really don't. But there was a moment where I felt like, is this going to be what it is forever? And would I still want to do it? And the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, Ah. I'm just going to keep going then. Okay. But I think... I have that engine in me that was built from a place when I was younger of wanting to prove myself and wanting to have the opportunity and wanting to be ready should I ever be lucky enough to be called on that I think that part of my, if if my being is a car, that engine is always present. And mm. so it, for a long time, I think that engine, that drive got me through even mm. when I was asked to do things that were kind of taxing and hard. Mm -hmm. And now that same engine and that same drive is there. But what I had in terms of my um, my desire to prove myself, my willingness to push myself at all costs, you know, that thing when you're young and you feel like to to succeed as an actor is to suffer, you know, that you're you have to sort of bring your dark night of the soul forward always or you're not an actor. And it's like, I think I subscribe to some of that belief. Whereas now I recognize the value of a very solid, fulfilling, fruitful life Mm -hmm. as the thing that can inform your work in a very, very beautiful way. And that the more self-care you provide for yourself, whether it's a meditation or a hot bath or looking into your dog's eyes or your parrot's eyes or looking at the night sky or reading a book or listening to a piece of music, talking to a friend, whatever fills you up, the Mm -hmm. more you have that sated internally, you are then able, I think, to offer more artistically. And I Mm -hmm. think I was sort of running from a different operational system Mm -hmm. until recently, thinking I had to be sort of uh, a pile of bones and flesh on the road in order to yeah. to be considered for myself to even think I was doing anything worthwhile. And I don't feel that way anymore. Um, and I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, the opportunity that I 
have yeah. now that then allowed me to take an exhale and sort of reassess, or if it was mm-hmm. in fact that I just burned myself out of the other way of thinking and I can't, mm-hmm. it's like the old operating system is no longer working on my new computer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Totally. And as of recently, and by recently, you do mean kind of in the last year. In the last year, yeah. And I'm sure the pandemic has kind of shown a a, a brighter light on this in terms of where I put my value and my interests, what really matters to me in life. um, Yeah. What, you know, there was a, there, there was, there has been a time in my working life where I would never consider saying no to a job ever. Mm -hmm. Even if it meant being away from my family, even if it meant being away from my loved ones, even if it meant being so exhausted that I, you know, because I thought, And I still think this to a degree, I am so lucky that I have an opportunity to do it, that I don't want to, and that I can say yes, and that someone's actually asking me to show up. Mm -hmm. Um, That feels Mm. really uh, unique and special and rare in any industry, Mm -hmm. but in ours particularly, is really hard to make a living as an actor and to feel inspired and to feel like you're really bringing something to the table. Um, That is... That is a lucky, rare air to be breathing. And so, mm. you know, I think that's not lost on me. Um, right. But I, I do think that now that I've had, this is, you know, this time that we've all had for the most part up until recently when everything sort of has started to move back forward towards being operational again is the longest mm. t- downtime I've had in about five or six years, which yeah. is very, very, very lucky. But it's the first time I had a forced opportunity to go, no, wait a minute why am I doing this? Why am I saying, why do I have to push my, why does it have to be this hard or this much? Or why am I expelling this much energy? Couldn't I, Mm -hmm. couldn't I choose the thing? Because, you know, you forget when you're younger that the things you say yes to, you end up spending three to five to six months of your life working on, of your life Mm -hmm. that you cannot get back. This, this is how you choose to spend your time and the people you're working with are the people you choose to spend your time with on the planet earth. For the, for yeah. the time that you're allotted, it, that, is a, that is something to really think about. And I think the pandemic has sort of put that into very sharp focus that it's almost impossible for me to assess anything I might do uh, without, mm-hmm. without seeing it through that lens in a way, you know? Totally. That's really, it's, that's beautifully put. And I think there's also this thing, it's sort of a recurring theme in these podcast interviews where the catch-22 of, I guess, any life in the arts, but maybe especially as an actor, is that in those early career days when you're yes first of all saying yes but also partly because you can handle so much extreme emotion and you can enact that cost the irony is that you also don't have the life experience to be able to go to such extremes you have that later in life Mm -hmm. so but later in life is maybe when you're switching up your operating system and not (laughs) willing to expel as much energy so true so like it's interesting did you ever have that early in your career like what do you remember about your early career mentality of post law and order <laughs> working in new york days i it's funny it's impossible to think about it without thinking about how i see it from where i sit currently which is how little i knew how mm-hmm. little i knew about acting how little i still know about acting but mm. uh, but i i just what I, rem- what I remember thinking, because I did, you know, I, as I said, I got very lucky. I worked, you know, six months out of school and uh, high school and I did not go to college and um, mm-hmm. I was able to make a living and pay my rent and have insurance. And that, that was, you know, sh- shocking and um, peaceful making to know that that could happen. Yeah. Um, but I don't remember having any um, dreams like I want to play had a gabbler. You know, I had okay. thoughts like, I'd like to be Julia Roberts. Do you know what I mean? Like they were, mm. they were, they were uh, a very, um, in the beginning of my, you know, I'm talking about when I'm like 18 or 19, yeah. uh, which then a career path, a career path but then it changed yeah. and became like, oh, I'd like to be Jessica Lang because her work mm. just really, there was something so soulful about it that it was impossible for me not to, I found it hypnotizing, um, and I think, I think, I think what I, what I could say about it, uh, if I can try to be articulate about it, which may not be possible, but is <sighs> that, uh, I knew that I, that I didn't know what I was or wasn't as an actor, but I knew when I saw acting that spoke to me, that it was important and interesting to me to try to figure out what it is that they were doing. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. felt like a student then. Mm. but more from the place of, can I copy it? And less from the place of like, can I understand it? That's something that happened later when my Mm -hmm. acting, the, the, the people I became more interested in were more on the fringes of, of, um, 
uh, either notoriety or fame. They weren't, they weren't as, you know, like Kim Stanley, who is my favorite actress of all time. Uh, mm -hmm. and very few people really even know who she is. And, um, so it was like starting to study those performances and think, what is she doing? Why and how is it, why is it so effective? And, hmm. and that was what I thought about early on. And then now I just simply think, um, I only think about what is, what is truthful. Mm -hmm. What is the truth of the, of the scene, the moment the yeah. you know, the, and I, I am much less interested in the result, um, mm. in terms mm -hmm. of how it hits a particular person when watching it. I don't um, often think about it like that. Um, you're often putting yourself in the, maybe in the shoes of the actor. I'm, I'm thinking about the person I'm playing and trying to stand, mm -hmm. uh, really as inside it as possible so I can yeah. commit to their belief systems and, uh, thoughts, Ooh. ideals, desires, because they are often different from mine. Yeah. And rather than, like you said, you wanted, it was first Julie Roberts. Are you talking about like, you wanted to copy in the sense of career moves or copy actual acting techniques A combination of both like i okay. was so charmed by her the world was yeah. charmed by her and yeah. i was like what is it that she's doing totally. and there were times in my younger life where people were like you sort of look like her you've got a big lips and big brown eyes and i was like i do and so then i was like maybe i could have that um and of yeah. course you know you can only have that if you're julia roberts because julia robert you know she's she's a she's a magical creature uh i find her so just charm personified and um, and you know, it's unique to her. It's like that Martha Graham to Agnes DeMille letter about, about, mm -hmm. um, keeping the channel open as a, as an artist and that there is only one of you in all of the world yeah. and time and space. And if you block what moves you, the world will not have what you have to offer. So there was no way I could emulate Julia Roberts, but as a young person, I was like, I could try to smile really big and oh she's easily she she's easily um charming and charmed and she's you know I just thought well uh you know it was me just trying to assess that thing uh, yeah. that like what makes a person successful you yeah. know and I constantly was dyeing my hair and I was constantly you know trying to um you know, I would change my speech patterns. To, it was like a psych, it was like a psych, psychopath. Like it was just like I should have been in an institution. It was like me, <laughs> me having such uh, no no purchase on my own identity. Really, is right. what when I look back at it, it was me just you know searching in the dark, kind of blindly for something that I thought would give me the ticket to yeah. opportunity. Because that's what the industry is demanding. The industry wants you to have their ticket ready. Yeah. They want you to fit into a mold of something. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's often why actors, people are like, Oh, they always play the same thing. And it's often not the actor's fault. They have to yeah. work and they want to continue yeah. to work and they're going to show up where they're asked to show up. And very often do you have the power or the control to sort of, this mm -hmm. is actually something Kate Blanchett, uh, we were having a conversation the other day, uh, as it pertained to Mrs. America. And, Mm -hmm. She was talking about how, you know, I think people think that there's some crystal ball that you have and you can look and make these ch these choices career wise yeah. that are some kind of predestined, predetermined greatness choices that that have so little to do with what's actually happening, like the happenstance of it all and the luck of it all. And, um, you know, just it, it, it so often has very little to do with your own personal um car driving it in a direction. It sort of just takes, it just goes somewhere. And hopefully, you know, it's like, it's not really in your hands so much. Um, mm. And, you know, how often have we all been in a situation where we have had an acting job that we loved and on paper seemed like would absolutely be a sh an assured success. And then something about it, the alchemy of it, it just doesn't work, you know? And then other times yeah. the things that you thought nobody would care about or see become, you know, Huge hits. huge hits and That's things and you can't like, figure out why and it's like yeah sometimes it does work and then it gets canceled you've been in so many you've been in a lot of tv shows that have aired four or five episodes. <laughs> That's correct, Jack. Thank you for bringing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we like talking about that. I'm going to ask you about your worst audition horror story. We're going to go there. No, you know. I want you to go there. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like, I like this idea that even if you are trying to define yourself by imitating or in relation to some other star, at least the curiosity is there. And curiosity is, as you were saying before, about like your mission and the, this idea of asking yourself, well, do I want to go there? And do I want to go there even if it's not great and the cost is too much? Yes. Like you've never had a plan B. I've never had so a plan B, no. That's your drive right there is you're going to look for the great work. You're going to look for that truth. 
And of course, it's just a process of doing that roll to roll as you figure out who you are, right? That's right. Your journey. <laughs> That's right. I guess there are a lot of people who subscribe to different thought processes, processes, whatever it is regarding acting and acting technique and how much of yourself you bring to the, to the character and how much you leave mm-hmm. the char- yourself, you know, on the side of the road and, and everybody has their own process. But I, I personally, uh, do believe that it's important for me to bring me to mm-hmm. it. And I don't mean, just to be clear, I don't mean my speech patterns, my way of, uh, my political worldview, my, uh, but mm-hmm. I mean my heart and my mind and my full self so that I am open to whatever is going to come through me, hopefully. And I don't mean that yeah. in a sort of like hokey wokey way. I just mean, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's the most impossible thing to talk about acting because who knows yeah. how and why it works when it works. I don't know. Okay. You know, Jason Robards would often talk about sometimes the muse appears and sometimes it doesn't. And you can be on a stage in front of a thousand people and no one's showing up that night. Your muse is just asleep on a park bench and is not interested in you <laughs> that evening. And, you know, sometimes you don't you don't have the best show. And, you know, we're not robots. It's there's there's right. a kind of thing that I think it's expected of actors that you can just push a button and cry and push a button and scream, push a button and laugh and put, you know, it's, it doesn't work like that. Um, at least not for me. Um, right. So I do think it's helpful for me to not excise myself from the story entirely in terms yeah. of like, you know, to, to repeat the Martha Graham thing, like my take on the character is going to be different than your take on the character. Oh. And the only way, and the only reason it becomes something worth discussing is your actual take on it is what's going to make it what it is. You specifically mm-hmm. Jack and me specifically Sarah and Kate, Kate specifically Kate and, you know, any actor fill in the blank, you know, it is your particular intangible, ephemeral, impossible mm-hmm. to, 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 to really put words to as, as, as evidenced by how clearly <laughs> I'm talking about it, but it is oh, yeah. this magical thing that like, yeah. you know, it's almost like I think of myself as a sieve that yeah. you, you pour the roll through you, but it still has to go yeah. through you. It has to go through you oh, in order to, I don't know, for me. I, I like that visual. Cause it's actually, um, cause some people say it's like a vessel, like you're the vessel, but you're saying the vessel has holes in it and has to go through. through I think it through. has to go through me and then it goes like into that. something that's catching it underneath, which will maybe Beautiful. be molded and therefore formed into the character. But it has to go through you to yeah. to be for, in order for it to be something unique to you. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I And it speaks to what you're saying about this is why you don't have a process. There's no there's no um one sieve fits all approach. No. For every role. Mm-mm, not for me. And it's terrifying. Everything you just described is freaking me out. <laughs> yeah, it's freaky, dude. <laughs> so that's why it's like, and so, okay, so going back to this idea of horror, which of course has been a commonality, and I would say American Horror Story is kind of, in my mind, always going to be the defining thing about your career because you've played so many different characters in it that I think audiences know to expect never the same thing. They, they don't have expectations about you, I think. So... Going off of that and into these years where you're in these leading horror roles, what is the difference? I mean, first of all, what is the difference with leading? But then is there, like, how do you get to this uh, extreme emotional high stakes thing? Um, I wish I knew how to answer the question about the high stakes thing and how do I do that? Um, Mm -hmm. I am a person who totally relies on text. And I guess that's yes. from my theater, you know, beginnings, uh, that text is king, queen, whatever you want to call it. Um, and most of your information will be in it. Um, mm-hmm. And it does you no good to decide it's not. You got to find out that it is. And when you find out that it is and you, and you, I think then you just, your imagination, that's when your imagination comes in and it becomes the most powerful tool you have is your imagination. Once you have the text and the context and you know exactly what's at stake and you know, and so in the horror genre and playing a leading role in a horror genre, whether it's ratchet or run, you know, these are people in extreme situations. But if I take the text and extrapolate all I can from, Mm -hmm. from them, then I have everything I need to know about what's at stake. And in both of these particular pieces, uh, everything Mm -hmm. is at stake, uh, in ratchet, Mm -hmm. the, the, um, safety and security, uh, and help mental health of her brother, her most important person in her life and Mm -hmm. in run, uh, her daughter, um, you know, and her connection Mm -hmm. to her child. So, you know, these are, nothing could be more Shakespearean and fundamental, uh, Ah, than, 
family, the fracture and the dissolution of a family unit and, and, and what that does to people. And, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, Medea comes to mind, you know, these, mm-hmm. these wonderful sort of, um, epic stories that go back so, so many years that, that, you know, are the primary, uh, the, the primary sources of great drama have to do with, mm-hmm. you know, even something like Game of Thrones. It's a story about mm-hmm. family, ultimately, and betrayal of yes. family, you yes. know, and yeah. dynasty is the same way. It's, it's just, it's mm. the, you know, the great stories that hook us in tend to be sure things like that. Yeah. And the, yeah, that's sort of, it's so interesting for both run and ratchet. It's your main driving force is in relation to another person, which like, so all of that, what you just described is more of the prep work of the Texas King. What then happens when you're on set? Like what tends to happen with how important is listening? How does chemistry work you know i think if i think and this could be totally incendiary but i think a good actor can have chemistry with a wall that's what i really believe Mm -hmm. i really do believe it and yes Mm -hmm. some things are the alchemy of things that are some things go you know but like me and me and sterling k brown like i would argue anyone not to have uh, chemistry with sterling k brown i don't have to do anything the only thing i had to do is be available and open to that face that soul that being and there'd be no way a person could not be moved in any direction about it that's sort of what chemistry is to me is are you moved by a person and i don't just mean emotionally i mean in every way tectonic plate shifting inside whether it's emotional sexual um, psychological intellectual are you being stirred by something and if you're really listening and really present odds are that's going to happen Mm. but it does require you to listen yeah it's another sieve maybe another sieve yeah it's got to pass through the the listening sieve the present sieve you know because i think when you're really focused on the result of the scene you're more thinking about yourself and then you're not engaged with the other person and the more you can engage with the person you're having your scene with I think the more you forget about what the result, the hoped for result is, and the more you're just living it. And when you're living it, you're relaxed, you're breathing. You know, I've been working with a movement teacher recently because I'm, I'm in the process of playing Linda Tripp and it's the hardest thing I've ever mm-hmm. done. And, and okay. I've never worked, I've never worked with a movement coach before. And, okay. and it was just a phenomenally amazing, wild experience. Her name is Julia Crockett. She's a spectacular person, but very good at this work. And she sometimes will be watching me in a scene and I'll get a text from her and she's watching the monitor and she'll say, are you breathing? And I'm like, oh, breathing. What is breathing? Like, and I realized I had done the whole scene sort of on one breath and holding my breath. And, Mm -hmm. and I just thought, oh, that's my control. That's my desire to have it go well. That's my standing in an audition room, waiting to hope and pray and God, please let them, I need this job. Oh God, I need this job. That attachment to that desperate need to have this finally work means I'm holding my paper. My sides are being held really tightly. I'm, my feet are digging into the floor and I'm working so hard to be good that I'm probably yeah. not very good. Okay. And so it was this kind of amazing idea that I'd never really thought about where somebody finally just said something simple as, are you breathing? And it was mm-hmm. like, oh, I actually don't think I was. And she sure. said, boy, you're so much better when you breathe. And I was like, oh, oh copy that. <laughs> <laughs> copy that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's been a very... um so the process sometimes on set has to do with simple things like like that, of remembering yeah. to listen and, and to engage with your scene partner and to play the scene. Don't play the result or the hope you... Mm-hmm. Ho- don't play the feeling you hope the, re- the audience is going to feel, you know, when they watch the scene. Um, it's yeah. so hard because I do think when you're... When you're auditioning and when you're you're actually asking someone to choose you, you are actively yes. working for a result, you know? Yeah. It's very hard to erase that sensibility mm. and that 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 thing that is actually driving the bull. When you're an actor and you're auditioning, that is your actual job. You're acting, mm. your auditions become your job until you get the job. And so you're spending all day and night and prepping and working towards getting, being chosen. And it's very hard mm. to unlearn that. I've never, th- I've never heard that before. Like it's been said that auditioning and acting are completely different skills, but they are, it's... but you're, you're focused on one particular, talk about an intentionality. Your intention is to get the job. Your intention has to be results oriented. Your intention is result oriented because you yeah. need it. You want it. And so 
even whereas an uh, yes and connected to the result of what it will mean if you get this job will it mean you'll get another job will it mean you'll get this you'll have this opportunity yeah. you'll pay your rent you'll get your health insurance there's so many things tied up with it it's That's very so hard to unburden yourself with that and then when you're on the set to go how do i just do this without thinking about trying to be good or yeah. you know it's or trying to get them to hire me or trying to get, you know, when that is ultimately you walk out of an audition room and nine times out of 10, if you're honest with yourself, what you've been trying to do is get the job. You weren't actually trying to play the scene. The scene. Yeah. Totally. You know, the desperation is going to be, it's just going to be there. Cause that's, there's so much. Of course that's going to get in the way of the of truth of the scene. Of course. Is part of your not trying, trying to be results oriented, the f- tied to the fact that you won't watch your own work. You've, you have never watched People vs. OJ. No, I still have not seen it to this day. Um, I have not seen it to this day. Which is not to, which is fine. <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> I think I'm one of those uh, people who I get very, very fixated on the mistakes, the things sure. I perceive as mistakes, the missed They're opportunities. They're missed opportunities. And then I get very angry with myself and there's nothing I can do about it. So I feel like, why do I want to go? And and the People versus OJ was was a very, very sort of magical unicorn-like experience in that mm-hmm. I had the most profoundly special time making it. And then it had this, the response to it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my working mm-hmm. life. So it was this this feeling of, oh, I don't need to see this to know that this had the impact that everybody hoped it would but that the biggest impact it had on was my life personally. And that, that has to be the most, and that's as it should be. So I let that, I've just let that maybe after in 10 years, or when it's been 10 years, it's already been five, I think, hasn't it? So, um, something like that. But I did, I have seen every episode of Ratchet because I was an EP and I felt a responsibility to do that. I've been watching all the dailies for, for this iteration of crime story, the Linda trip. Um, because I'm also an EP so that, you know, I feel I have these responsibilities that go beyond my personal performance and that uh, what I can be, have more clarity on is the story when I watch the dailies and I see what's landing and what isn't. And I find that helpful, um, producerially, um, but it's definitely challenging. (laughs) But also the other part that's hard about it is that I might see something that I am surprised and I like, and it's and the take opinion. I think it's yes. And it's the take I think was the best that may differ from the take the director starred as their favorite. And okay. so I don't have that much power to say to them, That's I really prefer that I know Ryan likes take six, six, but I think take four was better. And it's like, well, I can't argue with Ryan. He certainly has um, <laughs> earned his right to have his opinion be the final say. <laughs> but, you know, it is that kind of uh, interesting thing about... Uh, Everybody has a different point of view and different taste and different opinion sure. about what what strikes them as. Because I'm, of course, watching it through the lens of what I believe is most true about Linda. That doesn't mean that somebody else won't like the take because they liked their version, what they how yeah. they perceive Linda. And so, and I may think, oh, well, take four was more representative of what I feel is important about this story for her. And someone else may not have that opinion. So it's like that that's got its own other thing. But I have been watching my work in that way, but in a, like, for example, I have not watched Ratchet on Netflix when it came on, but I watched right. all the dailies and then I watched a cut of each episode and gave my notes and then I've not seen it since. So, okay. so I've been more in the, like how the sausage is made component of watching my yeah. work, but not watching the finished product. Right. And it is because it's also, it must be tricky to have that kind of, um, I'm making a hats motion because it's actor hat and then produ- producer hat where you have to then achieve distance from, can I look at this as a, as a performer? But is it then, because Ratchet will have a season two, so this is a long form TV show. Mm-hmm. Are there elements from the, um, the surprises that you're finding as a producer of like, oh, I like that take. Does that then maybe inform the character? Does anything in the producer hat inform the actor hat? I think what happens is sometimes, I'm sure people, I I would not be surprised if people have this experience as well, but like, if you ever like been helping a friend rehearse a scene for an audition and when it's not you auditioning, I know exactly what to tell them to do. I know what exactly is happening Ah. in the scene. I've never been more sure of it. I know exactly what it is. If, If you just turn the tables and said, now you're auditioning. I'd be like, oh, I don't know if what I was thinking is right now. No, it can't be that. It's like, I, Ugh. I, it's just fascinating when you take the onus off, um, yourself in terms of having to get the job. I, I suddenly can see something so clearly. So hmm. the producer hat, when I'm looking at it, uh, as neutrally as I can, 
Mm. I can see things I might not be able to see as a performer. Yes. Oh. Um, that can be helpful story wise, not so much for mm-hmm. my performance wise, but I think I can zoom out and okay. say, I don't think this tells the story. If we, if we cut this, if you've lost this, then you're dehumanizing him and you're making him seem like, and that, you know, I can see things story-wise that I can't even see on the page sometimes. Um, so. Okay. So that sounds like it's actually really, it's crucial to have that for specifically for Ratchet because you are the, the head of the, the call sheet and it's a, it's a big, long series. Mm-hmm. And um, I also kind of want to ask about costuming and wigs and makeup and color, because like in that show, especially it feels like, how can you not be image oriented and results oriented when it's about like even something like composition and color schemes and yeah, you must be involved in that as a producer. I was a little bit, but on this one, Ryan was so, um, he had such an exacting idea, uh, about what he wanted this to look like. I mean, the number of fabric swatches Lou yeah. Eric and I looked at yeah. for nurse ratchets, nurses out for what color the nurses outfits were going to be. Yeah. And the, com- I mean, I'm not kidding you, the number of swatches, I can't tell you the different shades of blue, green, green yeah. greener, greener, blue or blue or more green, less green, more brown in the green. It was just like dizzying. Uh-huh. Um, and the number of times we adjusted the placement of the collar and Judy's, Judy's um, costume came down. Her arms were a little bit lower. Mine were a little bit shorter. My skirt was a little longer. It just was, it was a, just a mm. very, and he was so exacting about it that, that I didn't really have much to say. What I did have to say about it was that yellow uh, suit that I wear. Um, yes. That was something that Lou and I really, really wanted for me to wear for the very first time Mildred went to the hospital and Ryan oh. had not chosen that. He had chosen something else. And Lou and I went and made a big case for why we thought it should be. Um, why is that? I think we felt the thing he picked was much more demure. And I think um, Lou and I felt the idea that she would be putting on a show Hmm. of her, the elegance addition she would bring to the hospital Mm -hmm. uh, and her uh, to to communicate a certain um, self-possession that she actually didn't have, um, that it communicated more Hmm. of a a grifter's kind of um, facade. And that it seemed more, more clear that, you know, she was, she was, she was affecting a persona than if she went with something that made it just seem a tiny bit more matronly and dowdy Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, not quite as, uh, glamorous. And we thought, you know, she might want to come in and try to seduce Dr. Hanover and with Mm. her elegance and her knowledge and maybe actually seduce. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's sexy. Yeah. So that was, yeah. So there were a couple times we, and, and, you know, he was great. He's a wonderful partner and collaborator that way. And he said, okay, if you guys feel that go for it, I don't know if I agree, but, and he let us do it. And I think we were right. That's cool. It also kind of begs the question, like how often in your career has an external choice, like costuming or, or wigs or makeup, um, been at odds with what you think the character is and like, how often are you able to how often are you forced to? Yeah, that's happened. To, that's happened to me a couple times in the non Ryan world more, where I yeah, have felt yeah. less comfortable saying, "Yeah, you know." And I won't say the the movie that it was, but there was one movie where I was the female lead, and I felt like I should have a say in something, but I I was so afraid. Um, mm-hmm. And every time I see a clip of it, I get mad at myself for not sort of standing up for. Mm something that I felt if any of the men had said something, they probably would have been listened to in a way and nobody sure. would have thought it was about vanity. And, you know, so there were little, little things that happened sometimes that I did feel were confusing in terms of the kind of character I was playing and the kind of glamour that the look was, was giving us that I felt was incongruous with the kind of woman she was. And I didn't want it to be so glamorous. Um, so, but I didn't win that battle. In fact, sure. I couldn't have won it because I didn't make a case for it. I was too afraid. Well, right. Yeah. That's actually, I mean, it's, it's good to hear. We, I, we always ask what, you know, what is one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? And that, that sounds like a good example of that. But I I almost also want to ask, like, especially in this year of 2020 of really re-questioning our values and figuring out what matters to us collectively and individually, how do you empower, like, what is your advice for empowering, especially actors, especially actors who don't have as much of a say, especially those at the beginning of their career? I mean, there's only one thing I think we can control as performers, and that is 
keeping ourselves uh, sort of free from the sort of societal, cultural burden of trying to be a homogenized, um, mm. digestible entity, mm-hmm. uh, human. Um, I think there are so at least for me, I spent a lot of time in the early part of my career, as I sort of spoke about earlier, trying to conform to what I decided was a surefire way of succeeding or making a present, you know, and what all I ended up doing was to become a real, real um, shitty kind of version of something that wasn't me and that wasn't yeah. authentic. And the reason I probably didn't work very much is that I, I took me out of the equation. I wasn't presenting myself uh, yeah. in my take on something. I sort of feel like the thing I feel matters more than anything in life. And certainly it, it pertains to, you know, your vocation, but is to be mm. true to yourself and your worldview and your take on something. And, and you don't have to do it uh, in the way you assume is the most castable because yeah. that's just not always the, it may be what they're looking for, but they don't know mm-hmm. what they're look. They don't know until they see it, the yeah, surprise think, yeah. of the thing. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times when I have been on the other side of it and I've been watching audition tapes and the thing that is the most su- is wonderful is when somebody goes, Oh my God, I had no, I never, it never occurred to me to play it that way. Wow. How interesting, how smart, how brave, how bold, like, You know, when a person just commits to something that is uniquely their take is, is the thing that stands out. It's, it's, um, it sounds sort of pat, but I, and I, but I don't mean it to, it's, it's just, I think, I think we, we live in a time where we are constantly there, you know, in a sort of sea and a barrage of images of ideals Mm. and of, you know, Mm. accepted norms and, uh, decisions that have been made for us about beauty. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's, it's impossible to not feel saturated and underwater with all of it, that you start to feel like if I'm not X, I can't have Mm. Y. And I sort of feel like, the only way to have the thing you dream of having is to bring you to the table and mm. not try to give some approximation of, of an idea. Like, you know, of yeah. it, it has to be really coming from you because I, I do think I owe, you know, it's the thing I've talked about this a million times. I have that Martha Graham to Agnes DeMille letter in, in dressing room of any play I ever do, because mm. uh, I, I really feel like, she's literally talking about being an individual and that Mm. you, you are the only you on the planet. And if you block your particular instincts and your uniqueness, the world will not have it. And then it will be lost forever. And that is your responsibility as an artist, Mm. I believe is to keep the channel open, be Mm. available to all the impulses that move you, not that are moving everybody else, and then that's the thing that happens when you see something that just shocks you right out of is, mm. is you're seeing somebody being so authentic and so uniquely themselves that you can't look away. And yeah. that's, you know, that's what I would say, I guess. That's beautifully put. Absolutely. There's also, it's so, it's so fascinating to think, I think maybe it's only actors who have to think about the idea of the mainstream, mainstream culture. So of course you're going to want to uh, be in that. Yeah. And it's sort of designed in a way that discourages the individuality because individuality is often way outside the mainstream. But I do, I am optimistic, I think, that with the way storytelling is kind of changing in the industry, that the mainstream is, is bigger than it used to be. There's more platforms and I more think stories. So. And, I do think so. Yeah. You look at things like I May Destroy You and you think, I don't know if that would have yes. been made, if that would have been made a couple of years oh ago. You're like the fifth podcast guest in a row to bring up I May Destroy You. Oh, it's, I mean, it just, it's, yeah. it's the, but, but this is my point. The reason it hits every single person that you've been talking to in that yeah. way is because so it was original. startlingly original and you yeah. hadn't seen anything like it. And it wasn't some cookie cutter version. Totally. It's a show about sexual assault, for God's sake, done in this way that is yeah. irreverent, funny, <laughs> uh, heartbreaking, true. I mean, it just, I, I, I mean, I, I can't, I could talk about it for a hundred hours, it, it, but, but, but <laughs> totally. that, that woman created something that we haven't seen before. 
yeah. by bringing herself and her point of view to, I mean, it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And so, Absolutely. so yes, is the fact that that made it to our televisions and the people all over the world have seen it is, a, is definitely a testament that we are moving in the right, right direction, you know? Right. And the reason it hit was because she was not trying to create something that is imitating or, or guess what the industry and what the audiences want. Neither the industries or the audience is new. No, they, nobody could have predicted that this would have been, you know, th- this is the thing, yeah. like people will surprise you in terms of what moves them. That's, you can't always so like, you know, the people, you know, a lot of movies get made or not made depending on a poll or a test and, you know, or people will screen movies and the number of movies I've been in that have tested through the roof that have made no money or have been bombs. It's just, yeah. I can't tell you. So like these things don't work. Sometimes yeah. they can give you an idea about something, but in the main, you're collecting a bunch of data, you know, hmm. but we are not, you know, data points. It's like you're not robots. We're not robots. We're not robots. We are human beings. And you are leaving that piece of the story out when you're only using collected data to to make your decisions creatively, you know? Sure. That's great advice. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't know if it's great advice, but... I think so. I think any early career actor can can use this, can use this as inspiration because it is so easy to just by default mm-hmm. do, follow Julia Roberts, like what you were saying, like just do the... Um, I tried to do it. Yeah. It's so interesting, the idea of like, yeah, I sort of look like her. I'm going to make my, my smile like her, but that's not possible. No, it's not possible because <laughs> Julia Roberts is Julia Roberts and I'm not Julia totally. Roberts. So, you know, <laughs> we have our Julia Roberts. Like what I was trying to do was just... Right find a footing somewhere and and you know i thought it would be something i don't know because it was proven to work but i was forgetting the part that it was julia roberts who was making that work because she Mm -hmm. is who she is do you know what i mean i was making it seem like she was doing some she was subscribing to some sort of formula and able to do that like she was a robot Mm -hmm. person that's just not how it goes yeah it's very fickle i mean it's a fickle industry for a reason because that kind of magic is not like you say it's not replicable Mm -mm. Yeah. No, nope. try as you might. Try as you as you have to, I guess, sometimes. Yeah. Um, Sarah, this is so wonderful. Thank you so much. I have to let you go soon. Can I ask you some very nerdy backstagey questions? Oh my god, yes. Like your favorite questions. Um hit me. How did you get your SAG card? Was it Law and Order? It was Law and Order. Yep. Okay. How do you remember like how did you get your equity card? Um, uh, my equity card. I did a like a um, did I get my equity card from that? I did a play in my sophomore year of high school that I did a couple it was at Playwrights Horizons, but it was like a two week run of something. I don't even know what the hell it was. It might have been part mm-hmm. of a like a um what is it when people come to town and they do a, a festival. It might have been some festival thing. Mm-hmm. Um and it was like two weeks of shows and I split the role with another person. Um, uh, and I can't remember why it might've been, she was too young. It was called Amelia again. That's what it was called. Um, mm. so funny. It was a, by a playwright named Michelle Lowe. Wow. I can't believe I'm remembering that. I can't remember anything else about it, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I might've got my equity card from then, or I got my equity card when I understudied Amy Ryan and the sisters Rosenzweig on Broadway, which was my first, that was the job I got after oh. my law and order episode. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Um, how often did you go on? I went on for two solid weeks because um, oh. Amy Ryan and her sister booked a trip to fr- Paris. Uh, she'd been with the show for a long time and the show was announced that it was going to close, oh. but she had like non-refundable tickets and could not go. So I knew well in advance that I was going to go on. So all my friends were able to come and I went on for, for two weeks cool. and it was the greatest okay. experience of my life, except for I, uh, I mean, I'll never, ever forget as long as I live, the feeling of the temperature change when the curtain, it was, it was one of those places where the curtain actually rose. And I remember yeah. sitting in the chair and looking over, you know, to the, to the wings and the stage hand was like, you know, are you ready? Thumbs up for me to pull the curtain. And I was Just like, thumbs show. up. And I remember the curtain going up and like the waft of cool air coming from the audience. Oh. And then the applause that happened for the set. And it was just, I'll just never forget it. It was a totally wild thing. And then at the end of that first uh, night that I went on, um, Michael Learned was playing my mother and we have to sing Harvest Moon, Shine on Harvest Moon at the end. And I'm a terrible singer. And um, (laughs) as part of the understudy rehearsal, we never rehearsed that part. And so Uh I did not sing it very well, so badly that she had to... (laughs) 
I'll never forget her face. She's like sort of sitting in a chair, looking down, and I was at her feet, just sort of having my my hands on her knees, and was like, "Shine on, shine on, harvest moon." And she was like, "We were supposed to sing together," and she had to stop because there was no way to match any pitch. There was no pitch that I was doing that was match. She could. There was nothing she could do. So she just stopped and just sort of looked at me adoringly while I sang, and I was like, "Oops." <laughs> and there was a person in the in the show who was also an understudy who was was a very good singer, and we worked on it every day after that so that I would not humiliate myself. But it was really something to do in front of a thousand people on a Broadway stage. It was really something. Shine it's on like- harvest. It was not good. It's not good. <laughs> it was not. You're not a. You're not a musical theater actor. Not me. Nope. Mm-mm. I feel like after all this talk of you being like, I, I need to refill and I'm traumatized and I, I'm i asking you to like relive traumas. No, you're not. But um, it's what we want on this podcast. What is your worst audition horror story? Do you have one that comes to mind? You know, I don't. I don't. I have a, 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 an audition that ended well that was seemed like it was going to be a horror story, but is in fact, I think the the thing I think about a lot because I think about... And this is something that I thought about when I was younger too, a younger actress, that the only thing that separates you from a job and not getting the job is the right pair of eyes, meaning the person watching. Mm. And my example Mm. for this is Ed Sharon, who was the executive producer of Law & Order. Uh, I had auditioned for Lynn Kressel a bunch. She was sort of the main gal at that time in New York who did, you know, a bunch of things. Um, and I'd been in for her a lot and I'd gone in for this episode of Law and Order and I got called back to a producer session. Her audit, her, 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 um, offices were in Midtown somewhere, I believe, but the audition was all the way down at the pier. I believe I had to go down someplace, um, mm. for Ed Sharon and the director. And I got called back I went down there to audition. I waited and waited and waited to go in. I finally went in. I did my audition, and it was a scene where I was supposed to cry a lot. I was supposed to be upset, terribly, terribly, unshakably upset. So, and I could, didn't cry a tear, didn't shed a tear. Nothing happened, dry as a bone. Yeah. And Ed Sharon, I, so I finished the scene, and I just sort of like had my paper in my hand, and I kind of looked up, and I'm all of 19. Oh, my God. Yeah. I look up, and he's, I'll just never forget, he was sitting directly across from me, and he said... He took a pause and he said, I think you're feeling something right now that if you take a minute, you could probably really use. And I said, um, what do you mean? He said, are you feeling embarrassed? And I said, <gasps> oh, God, and I said, yes. And my voice, my voice, my voice started to shake. And he said, do the scene right now. And I started to cry and I did the scene and I got the, and I got the job. Okay. So what what my point about it is a terrible story in a way. But the point yeah. is he, I must have done something in the audition, even though mm. I wasn't crying, that he liked, that made mm-hmm. him want to push me to do something he could tell I had right there. Yeah. So my point is he saw something, I don't know what it was, that made yeah. him want to say, I want you to try this by tapping into what he knew I was feeling. Yeah. And so and it made all the, and you know. So, so there, of course, sort of comes full circle to the thing we were talking about in the beginning about how I believe bringing myself forward. And by, by saying oh, yeah. that, I don't mean bringing my own personal trauma when I have to play a traumatized person. I'm not th- right. talking about that. I'm talking about right. bringing me, my heart, my experiences forward and allow it mm. to be present rather than pretending I don't exist and that just the character exists. Um, yeah. And totally. so he just saw something and, you know, mm. called me on it and... There, I mean, that was the first job I ever had, and it was the beginning of everything for me. And it was really his. I mean, he, yeah. I ran into him at a at a um, at a directors guild event two or three years ago, maybe, and I thanked him. I got to thank him in person for for doing that. It sort of it think, makes me think like it gives new meaning to the phrase "use it." Yeah, because people sometimes say in the audition room, "use it," but in that, it's like. Well, he had to ask me to use it. It, it took somebody yeah. knowing yeah. that it was percolating yeah. there and seeing it. And then saying, use it to me. To 19-year-old you who had never been on camera. Who had never been on camera, exactly. Yeah. So he kind of, he saw that. He saw something, and I still to this day don't know what it was. Wow. Yeah. That's very cool. It's a a traumatizing audition that then flips into something. Twist. Something more hopeful. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, thank you so much. Do you have any last parting words of wisdom? Anything you would like our listeners backstage users to um to know Hmm. you've given us so much thank you i don't know i just i love that backstage is such a resource and i just love that it i remember be i remember 
feeling like an actor when I had the paper in my hand, yeah. because it was like, this, this means I'm really doing it. And, you know, mm. there's something very powerful about knowing that you and I are having this conversation and that someone like me out there in the dark mm. might be listening to this and it might, you know, either comfort them or give them a tiny bit of hope. And, um, that is a pretty powerful thing to, to consider. It is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. Um, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all your work and I'm so excited. I'm so excited that you're already filming. I mean, I don't know how much you can tell us about this next project, but it sounds awesome. Um, well, it's the third iteration of American Crime Story. There was OJ and there was Versace. And now this is the impeachment of, of Bill Clinton. Um, Beanie Feldstein as Monica Lewinsky, uh, Clive Owen as, as Bill Clinton, me as uh, Linda Tripp. Um, it's just, as I said, the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, wow, yeah. And yeah, uh, it's hard. It's really challenging. Um, she's a very interesting character, and it's it's not been um, it's not been uh, uncomplicated to try to figure out how to get inside it. But sure. but again, this is why you do it. And um, the great news is, I think I'm playing a person who won't shed a tear the entire season, which might be, <laughs> I mean, I, I might be speaking too soon, but it's it's quite possible that that part of my uh, psyche will get a rest until we finish this one. And then mm -hmm. I start season two of Ratchet, which I'm sure oh, wow. I got to get ready for that too. Oh my gosh, Sarah, thank you. I could talk to you for hours, but I have to let you go. <laughs> well, we'll do it again. And I really appreciate it. Thank you for asking me such wonderful questions. Thank you. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi guys, Christine McKenna Torella. This was a moving interview for me this week, and not just because I too was that 20 something reading backstage on the subway and, and sharing that memory with Sarah Paulson is kind of thrilling to me. But, you know, working at backstage is also a pinch me moment. And I'm always honored to hear how actors started their careers with backstage and feel such a warmth and reverence like I do about what we do here. This episode, I am discussing self-tapes and remote auditions, because if you're an actor auditioning right now, that is most likely the way you'll be interacting with the casting team for the foreseeable future. And I continue to see receive a lot of questions about this from actors. Here is your checklist to set up your self-tape. First off, you should be recording on your phone or whatever equipment you have that has the highest resolution. It should be a tight to medium shot with a clean background so there are no distractions. It goes without saying that we need high quality audio so the least amount of background noise is possible and not recorded in a live room with an echo. And good lighting. We have to see the work that you're doing. Do yourself a favor and get a good reader. It's difficult to pay attention to your work if your reader is flat. Get the tape in in a timely fashion. Don't throw it into casting last minute, right? The sooner I get the work, the more likely I am to have time to review it and possibly give notes and get you on tape for a second time, right? And that's what you want. You want to continue auditioning for the role that you want. Record all the sides in the packet, including the callback material, and send it all in at one time so the team has it at hand to be able to share with the rest of the creative team. And I will know that you've had time to prepare and work on this material, right? So I'm going to expect that what you're sending me is your best takes. And that's why you should take extra care with self-tapes that you send in. And it's also, you know, I've been saying this for almost a year now. There are challenges in this time, but being able to control your product a little bit more, being able to control the auditions that you send out via self-tape, that's very powerful for an actor. And so really take advantage of that while you can. Head over to Backstage's YouTube channel where the Casting Insider series with Daryl Eisenberg, casting director in New York, there's a series of insights and really great advice on self-tapes. Next episode, I will be chatting about remote auditioning and how to set yourself up for success. On to casting highlights for this week, and today I'm focusing on reality and real people casting that we have on this site. 
There's a casting for mother-child pairs for a new episode of Face Your Mother on the Late Late Show with James Corden, in which real mothers and their son or daughters that are 18 plus share secrets of unknown facts to each other. And James Corden is the host. It's a super fun segment if you haven't seen it before. Details on the site. And there is a nationwide casting for a lucrative content shoot seeking people with real gardening experience from beginner to advanced. You just have to have a green thumb, be passionate about gardening. It is for a branded content shoot for miracle Grow Gardening. That's nationwide. Details on the site. Take a look. That's all from me. Break a leg in your upcoming auditions and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.